Hello everyone and welcome to CRAMSurge, clinical research appraisal and methodology for surgical trainees, where we pick a paper fresh from the press on a hot general surgical topic. We review it for you, we present it for you, we critique its methodology for you and provide top of the field expert opinions and teaching on research appraisal and methodology. My name is Gio Perrin and together with Professor Sababella Subramanian, Adam Haig, Ben Wood and Josh Lau, we bring you Crown Surge from the wonderful region of the Yorkshire and the Humber. Welcome again. Uh, today we have a special session with our guest speaker, Professor Danny Rosin from uh, Tel Aviv. We'll start as usual uh, with discussing a paper. Uh, this will be laparoscopic versus open liver resection for hepatocellular carcinoma, a case control study with propensity score matching, which was published in the World Journal of Surgery uh, very recently. As mentioned, uh, after that, uh, Prof. Rosen will talk about the editorial process uh, for surgeons, particularly uh, as it applies to the World Journal of Surgery, as he is an associate editor uh, there. I'll uh, leave you to it then. So, uh, thanks again, um, everyone, for joining. Um, as you can see, today we are going to talk about a paper that was recently published in the World Journal of Surgery entitled Laparoscopic versus Open Liver Resection for Hepatocellular Carcinoma. Uh, and this is a propensity scored matching type study. Uh, it comes from a single institution uh, in Japan, a fairly high volume center uh, in terms of liver section. And uh, it was, uh, as I mentioned, published very recently, uh, just in April uh, 2021. Uh, with me presenting today is uh, Wasif, um, one of my uh, registered colleagues in the auction, the Humber region. And Wasif, so what do you think about the premise of this paper and the title? Uh, relevant topic? Uh, thanks, Gio. Yeah, I think it's a, a relevant topic. So, I mean, we had a look into this. Um, hepatectomy is an effective treatment for hepatocellular carcinoma. Um, although perioperative outcomes of hepatectomy for HCC have vastly improved, uh, post-operative complications can occur in some highly invasive and complicated cases. Um, conventionally, open surgery was the mainstay of treatment for this. Um, however, more recently, laparoscopic liver resection is now becoming the accepted worldwide technique. Um, there are a number of advantages of laparoscopic surgery, um, not only in, in HCC, but in other settings. Uh, these include quicker recovery um, due to a reduction in complication rate, um, which in effect uh, leads to a reduction in hospital stay and earlier discharge for the patient. Um, the caveat remains that this disadvantage persists when you correct for the difficulty of the procedure in the HCC context uh, remains to be seen, I guess. Excellent. So um, in this background, the aim of this particular paper is to clarify whether laparoscopic hepatectomy for hepatocellular carcinoma can contribute to reduction in risk of uh, postoperative complication. And they use propensity score matching, uh, as I mentioned earlier on, balancing for resection ratio and difficulty of the involved procedures. Now, um, if I were to say this in a PICO format, uh, bearing in mind that it is not a randomized clinical trial, however, this format seems to fit uh, reasonably well. Um, the patients involved are um, adult patients affected by hepatocellular carcinoma, which is amenable for surgical resection. Uh, the intervention is a laparoscopic hepatectomy. The comparison or standard would be open hepatectomy. Uh, and the primary outcome of this study is postoperative complications. And we'll have a look at how this is measured uh, later on during our presentation. So uh, Wasif, ball back to you. Thanks, Gio. Um, so there's a retrospective study uh, which was carried between 2011 and 2019. Um, as Gio's already mentioned, um, the key factor for this study was um, looking at propensity score matching. Um, a number of variables for this were used. Uh, some of these are age, uh, sex, BMI, um, hepatitis infection, previous history of hepatectomy, platelet count, child pew score, and so on. Um, the two key factors which uh, differentiates it from already uh, pre-existing published literature um, and which the authors felt were quite sort of pertinent um, is the liver resection ratio and uh, the difficulty of the procedure. So the liver resection ratio in this paper, they measured using the resection volume and the divided by the total liver volume. Um, the resection volume for anatomical resection was calculated using um, volumetry and for non-anatomical resections, um, the weight of the specimen was used. 
Um, in this particular paper, the difficulty uh, was measured using the IMM uh, classification, uh, which is dependent on the location and the extent of the liver resection. Um, we are aware that there are a number of uh, different classifications. However, the IMM was the one that was chosen by the authors. Um, that's slightly different to what we already know, things such as minor versus major liver resection, which is usually dependent on the number of segments that are resected. Um, the authors used multivariate regression analysis uh, to look for predictive factors of post-operative complications, um, and the results of these were presented as odds ratio and p-values. Uh, thanks, Theo. Right, so let's have a look at the exclusion criteria. So uh, we know already that they included adult patients with an HCC amenable for surgical resection. However, there are some exceptions to this uh, rule, uh, particularly the uh, presence of macroscopic tumor thrombus um, made the patient not eligible for this particular study, invasion of the inferior vena cava, necessity for a vascular reconstruction, uh, the presence of portal vein embolization before surgery, that was also an exclusion criteria. Um, whenever a simultaneous uh, operation was performed for a different disease, the patient were excluded. Nodal dissections performed concomitantly to the procedure were excluded as well. And combined resections uh, with other organs were also um, excluded. Um, so it is a, a reasonably uh, selected population uh, here. And Wasif, uh, ball back to you to talk about the uh, outcomes. Uh, thanks, Leo. Um, so the primary outcome of the study was uh, post-operative complications. Um, in this case, they used the uh, clavin uh, dindo which is a well-known classification, um, and they only used a grade three or higher, um, and uh, sort of excluded grade one and two. Um, so some of the examples of this were things such as um, post-operative ascites, effusions, uh, bile leak, um, abdominal bleeding, abdominal abscess, and so on. Um, further building on that, um, they used the Comprehensive Complication Index um, as a secondary outcome, um, which, is, which provides an assessment of patients' overall morbidity. Um, and other secondary outcomes were post-hepatectomy, liver failure, and uh, textbook outcome. So in this study, they used the International Study Group of Liver Surgery definition of post-hepatectomy liver failure. Um, which um, talks about the deterioration in the ability of the liver to maintain its synthetic excretory and detoxifying function um, as characterized by a rising INR hyperbilirubinemia, um, which is based on day five or onwards post-operatively. Um, they used six parameters for the total outcome um, after surgery, and these were negative surgical margin, um, no use of perioperative trans transfusion, no post-operative complications, no readmission, no prolonged hospital stay, and no post-operative mortality uh, within 30 days after surgery. Uh, over to you, Gio. Right. Uh, so let's uh, move on to results. Um, so uh, 344 hepatectomy cases were uh, reviewed in total for potential inclusion in this study. Uh, 54 were excluded as not meeting the criteria and 290 was finally analyzed. Uh, as you can see, uh, 178 uh, procedures were performed as open operation and 112 as laparoscopic. Uh, following um, propensity matching, as you would expect, they generated two cohorts, which are identical in number 68 and 68. Uh, now, from now on, we'll focus on the propensity score matching results. Uh, I'll give you just a brief overview of the unmatched cohort uh, sort of pre-operative and post-operative variables. There's a couple of important points to make. Um, well, um, as the authors expected, there is a difference in terms of uh, difficulty grade uh, between the two groups uh, when the cohorts are unmatched. So tendentially, laparoscopic cases tend to be easier cases. Uh, and that's why the laparoscopic approach is chosen. So the premise of the study is corroborated by this uh, particular data point. Um, a variety of other variables were different between the two groups, uh, including tumor size, including proximity to major vessels and resection ratio. Um, in terms of postoperative outcomes, uh, just very briefly, in the unmatched cohort, uh, complications were way more common in the uh, open group. Uh, and this is corroborated by both a rate of complication um, uh, of grade three or above 
as well as a, a CCI, uh, which was higher on average in the open uh, group. Um, textbook outcome was also significantly less common in the uh, open group. Um, now, uh, we'll move on to the uh, propensity score match results, uh, and Wasif is going to give us a rundown of the results. Uh, thanks, Leo. Um, so as you already uh, mentioned, the crux of the study was propensity score matching. Um, so in the end, uh, from their total cohort, they managed to match uh, 68 patients in each group. And these are the results of those uh, patients. Um, surgical outcomes between the two groups, open surgery and liver laparoscopic resections were compared. Um, as in the unmatched uh, group, a significant difference was noted between um, open and laparoscopic liver resection in terms of complications of grade three or above. Um, in keeping with that, um, the comprehensive complication index was also lower in laparoscopic liver resection group compared to the um, open liver resection group. Um, no differences were noted in post-hematectomy, liver failure, bl blood loss, or operation times between the two procedures. Um, and the fact that these patients developed less complications also um, determined the fact that they had a reduced hospital stay um, in the laparoscopic group. Um, and a greater number of patients also achieved a better total outcome um, in the laparoscopic group when compared to the open uh, uh, liver resection. Um, over to you, Gio. And uh, finally, uh, the authors also performed multivariate logistic regression analysis to determine which factors were actually associated with um, uh, better outcomes in terms of Craviandindo um, grade three or above complications. And uh, it's not entirely clear to me reading the paper whether this was performed on the entirety of uh, the cohort, which I think that would be the best way to do it, uh, or just on the matched patient. Um, but generally speaking, a variety of variables were associated with a reduction in a complication rate. However, only two actually uh, were confirmed as statistically significantly associated with better outcomes on multivariate logistic regression, and those are surgical approach. Um, so a laparoscopic uh, approach does reduce surgical complications uh, and proximity to major vessels. Um, so uh, back to you, Wasif, for the um, self-reported limitations. Um, so the authors um, have reported a number of self-limitations of the study. Uh, the biggest one being um, the small number of patients that were involved in the study. Um, so overall, they started out, off with uh, roughly 290 patients. And the pro after propensity scored uh, matching, on, there were only 68 patients in each group. Um, obviously, this makes it difficult to see whether the results are generalizable to um, uh, other institutions or not. Um, again, the results are reported from single institution, uh, which is the limitation of the study. Um, there's also the limitation in terms of if the surgeons had to learn um, the laparoscopic technique and therefore the learning curve involved. Um, the IMM uh, classification that was used itself has some limitations, um, such as it doesn't account for uh, previous surgery that the patient has undergone. Um, over to you, Gio. Yeah, so there's another few points that uh, we kind of picked up as we were reading uh, the paper. Uh, I'm, I'm sure you noticed at the beginning I didn't read the full title, um, and this is because I don't think this is a case control study. Uh, I think this is a, a cohort study uh, which uses propensity score matching um, as a technique. Um, there's a few other points. Um, Obviously, uh, we do know that in the past 50 years, mortality and mobility from liver resection has declined significantly. Uh, this trend has obviously started to level, um, and, uh, but we are still seeing a year on year change uh, with better and better outcomes. Um, so I think perhaps uh, correcting or matching for a year uh, um, where the surgery was performed could have been a good idea. Uh, but that would have obviously restricted the number of propensity score match patients even more, probably. Um, certain effect is important. Now, this is a single institution study, uh, and uh, uh, it would have been interesting to see uh, uh, how many surgeons actually perform laparoscopic resection and open resections, uh, and how many of them actually performed exclusively one uh, rather than the other. Uh, there's uh, a few... Uh, points that have been, I think, pretty heavily discussed in the HPB literature about oncological outcomes of um, these uh, types of resections. And it would be interesting to know um, 
perhaps the uh, disease-free survival or uh, longer-term survival that obviously is not included in uh, this particular uh, study. Uh, the oncological outcome seems to be compatible in terms of R0 resection, but um, as we know from a variety of experiences, um, both here in Yorkshire and uh, in uh, the Eastern countries, um, R0 resection does not always uh, correspond to um, long-term outcomes. There surely has been a change in prosperity protocols uh, in the past sort of 10, 15 years, uh, and these studies span throughout quite a few years. So it would be interesting to know a bit more whether that could be a further confounder. And finally, uh, I think this is more of a point um, for our audience, UK audience here. Um, we do not see probably as many HCCs um, as uh, the Japanese uh, centers do. Uh, most of our corrective, most of our liver sections are related to colorectal cancer more than anything else. So um, to conclude, uh, in uh, the words of the author, uh, laparoscopic liver section for HCC is effective in reducing the incidence of postoperative complications. Uh, and in the table, you can see a few points that uh, we have made throughout the uh, presentation. And this brings us to the uh, end of this um, paper discussion. So uh, if there are any questions, uh, feel free to ask. So. Um... As usual, I'll try and give you a brief overview of the discussion we've had. As noted, uh, this is not really a case control study. So the first question that rises is what is a control study and what is a cohort study? Um, detailed explanation about uh, uh, study designs, I'll refer to our chapter two uh, types of study and designs, which you can find on our website, cramsers.org. But in brief, uh, in a cohort study, individuals uh, are selected based on a particular exposure or a particular reason and followed up in time to determine uh, an outcome. Uh, in a case control study, a group of patients is selected uh, as uh, affected by a particular outcome uh, and we then go back to look at uh, exposure and compare them uh, with uh, a matched population that um, is uh, healthy, not affected by the disease. Methodologically speaking, the key component is uh, when we define exposure and outcome and how this is evaluated. Furthermore, we talked about uh, propensity score matching and the limitations of this technique. Um, it is a technique that is useful uh, in terms of creating two uh, equal populations based on a variety of variables. Uh, however, it does introduce unavoidably uh, a degree of selection. It is therefore obviously not as methodologically rigorous uh, as a randomized control trial. At this point, I will leave you to Professor Rosin lecture. Enjoy. Firstly, I'm usually grateful um, for Professor Rosin to agree to come and talk to us. Uh, we're, we're just a small group. He's a very busy man. So I'm, I'm uh, extremely delighted and uh, honored to have him here. So, um, Professor Rosen is an associate editor of the World Journal of Surgery, as, as you have heard. He is head of ambulatory surgery and deputy head of surgery and transplantation in Tel Aviv, where he's an associate professor, and then he uh, is trained in Israel and the US. Now, I've never met him uh, in flesh, although I see him now, um, but I have known him from his writings on a group called Surgeonet for many years now. And I know that he's a very talented surgeon from the videos that he has posted. And from his writings, uh, everyone on Surgeonet would, uh, would agree uh, that he's a very wise and thoughtful man. And at the same time, he has an amazing sense of humor. So, uh, um, so that's the short introduction. And again, thanks, Danny. I know it's well beyond 10 o'clock for you. Really appreciate you joining us. Thank you very much. And it's really flattering. And I'll just share my screen. Let me see if it works. Okay, so uh, we'll be talking a little bit about what happens in the journal that I work for. That uh, I think it's quite common in most of the journal, most of the leading journals, the way the uh, the things go behind the scenes, and how I think it's important for those who write papers or intend to write papers uh, to know what's the process actually in the, 
sometimes we ask myself, why does it take so long? There are many, many things that uh, go behind the scenes. So first of all, a few words about who is actually doing this uh, work of uh, peer review. And uh, in the journal, we have the reviewers, which are usually experts in the field, and the papers are sent to them according to their expertise. And there's an editorial board, and the editorial board uh, actually is uh, comprised of reviewers, but those that uh, do it for quite a long time and uh, dedicated and prove that they are worthwhile. And basically, to be an editorial board member is an honor, but you tend to do the same, maybe, maybe more of the same, and review papers. And then we have the associate editors. Uh, which actually, on another level, they uh, review the, uh, the papers, but they don't really go into the details. They send out the, the, the papers for review to the reviewers, and eventually they get the reviews and send their recommendation uh, to the editor-in-chief, which is the actual uh, decider of what will be the fate of the journal. Of the of the manuscript, but we have to remember that we have the editorial manager, which actually uh, takes care of everything. So uh, she's the one that uh, do the hard work of uh, allocating the the, the papers uh, and following up and uh, handling all the uh, computerized work that we have to do. Everything is now, of course, online. Um, so if we talk a little bit about uh, peer review and why is it important, and what, what is the process of peer review? Uh, it's, re it's very important because this is actually a way to improve the quality of the papers because it go to surgeons, in our case, or doctors that are uh, proficient and uh, well experienced in this specific field of the published paper, of the intended to publish paper. And they know the literature, so they can suggest uh, more references. And sometimes, you know, surgeons try to, uh, it's very common to claim that this is the first uh, case of, uh, or first study or the only study in the world. And many times it's not really the truth and uh, the truth and uh, the reviewers can actually point and the authors that to other re uh, relevant references and acknowledge them. And they also can assess what's the importance of the findings. Sometimes findings are statistically significant, but they have no, no real clinical uh, effect or importance. So uh, this is one of the uh, important way to, uh, ways to um, judge a manuscript. And of course, we, we want to avoid plagiarism and fraud. And this is done, we'll talk about it in the end, but this is done now mainly uh, in some uh, computer programs that can actually scan huge number of, uh, of, of papers and compare them and alert us to risk of plagiarism. And uh, this is also, it's not only for the, writers being a, a reviewers are actually pays in a way in your academic development first of all you get to to get exposed to many manuscripts sometimes it's really interesting to see what people are doing around the world and also there's some uh, honor in being a reviewer so the principles uh, uh, basically that without uh, peer review, there's no really control on what is being uh, uh, published and scientific communication is not really um, well controlled in a way that uh, you cannot really trust the results. So peer review is a process that intends to, to, to put some kinds of control. We know that it's much easier to immediately publish in Facebook at the same time than at the same day, the same hour, same minute, then waiting of sometimes a few months until your work is published. 
but of course the quality is much different. So we want to keep the um, uh, scientific quality of these papers as high as we can. Of course, there are many journals, many uh, low level journals that will accept everything. And some of them you get, you have to pay and by paying you actually uh, get to be published. But in the higher level uh, journals, this is um, quite controlled and really rely on good peer review process. <coughs> So how do we do the peer review? First of all, we get a first impression. Uh, we look at the, uh, at the paper and see whether it's original, whether it, there's some important importance to the field that the manuscript deal with. And um, we look at the structure, we look at the language. Some of the, these manuscripts are being sent back just because they don't look well, the, the language is not, really appropriate and um, that's maybe a bias because uh, most of the journals that we deal with we read are English based and uh, there's some uh, advantage of course for English speaker uh, speaking uh, uh, surgeons or, or writers and but we get a lot of papers that come from other places when where English is not the first language and sometimes they're being rejected or at least returned for review, a re a revision because the language is not, not enough to be published. Then we go on to look at the abstract, uh, whether it really summarizes the, 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 the message or the study or the work that was done. Uh, does it give us the key findings uh, does it conform to the length that is appropriate for a summary? We go on to the introduction and look whether it's clear enough to really introduce the topic and uh, why actually the study was done, what was done before, what's the aim, what we try to achieve in the, in the current, uh, current paper or current study. Uh, and then the reviewer can suggest some changes and reorganization. Um, we expect the reviewer to be specific to actually help or assist the authors uh, in repairing or correcting um, the, the work and not really be uh, critical, but be with constructive uh, criticism. We go on to the method methodology and first of all, we have to make sure that what was done can be really repeated uh, and with similar outcome, because we want to, know, to, to make sure that the methodology is really a effective one and, a, and correct one. Um, we have to look whether the author's reference to previous published methodology, uh, because many times methodologies uh, repeat themselves and we just mentioned it, this was done in that way or this way but it has to be uh, well referenced um, if it's a new methodology it has to be accurately described and sometimes some supplementary material should be added which is not will not be included in the main article but will be available sometimes online because sometimes it's too complicated or too long uh, to be included in the main article, but it has to be there somewhere, somewhere because some, if you want to do a real critical review, you have to uh, know these details. Uh, one of the uh, ways that we uh, judge or examine uh, articles, if we look, for example, at the uh, systematic reviews or meta-analysis, it's the PRISMA uh, method, and we also saw that before when we describe a patient, we start with a large number. And if we talk about systematic review, we start with a large number of articles, but many times many are excluded for this or that reason. And in some cases, the article looks appropriate, but you cannot really retrieve it. 
and uh, many times patients are excluded. So eventually, many times you see that you start with a very large number and the actual uh, manuscript describes very few, uh, if it's meta-analysis, very few articles. So if you start with 100 articles, but eventually you describe only two or three, you didn't do much. So this will take away all this uh, advantage of meta-analysis. Uh, this is the same. And it's good to see that in, in this kind of diagram uh, that you can actually graphically see what you're dealing with. It's much easier to, to review a, a, an article when you have the studies in front, uh, the numbers in front of you. And it's also true for, for large, assumably a large uh, studies, when you start with large number of patients, and eventually uh, you get very small numbers. So all the, the essence of the study is actually lost. It's quite common to see that we have um, removed 10,000 gallbladder since 1962. And eventually we end up with a group of five patients with unique anatomy. So it doesn't really matter how much you did. You did. We, we wanted to see the, the actual number. The actual number is five, it's not 10,000. So all this study, as much as you uh, show off, it doesn't mean anything. So uh, these kind of graphs are really, really, really helpful. We really like to see them, but really give you an, a graphical view of what's, how did the, the work done, it was done. Then we go to the results and the discussion and we, uh, the reviewer should uh, suggest improvement because the main reason to do a peer review is not, not to attack the, the, uh, the author, but actually be, to help him to get, uh, to do a better job and get a better paper uh, done. And many times the, the, this revision, sometimes more than one revision, really brings out a better paper uh, to the journal. So it's, it's really an important task and you have to comment on the logic and the, the justification of your con conclusions. And uh, you have to comment on specifics like the figures, the tables, you have to really have to go into the details of the article in order to, to create a good uh, review. And then you have to uh, phrase it in a way that will really help the, uh, the, the author to improve the paper or in a way that will really describe why this paper uh, is not really uh, appropriate for publication in, in this specific, at least in this specific uh, journal. You may suggest further work, additional experiment, uh, going back to the raw data and reanalyze it. So there are many changes that you can suggest in order to, uh, to get the article to being, uh, to, to get accepted and with the, some authors will just say, okay, this is too much for us. We'll just go to another journal which will accept it. And many times you can find another journal, but many authors really are keen to, to get their work published and do this uh, revision and go back to the data and reanalyze it, rephrase it, rewrite it, um, and actually come up with a better, uh, better article, better paper. Then we have the conclusion, which has to be a really short comment on why the study was done and what's, what's, what, what's the difference that it makes and uh, why is it important to, to publish it? Uh, first, uh, it's, uh, it's actually the, the essence of the article. It's not a real summary. The summary is actually in the abstract, not in the conclusion, but this is a, like few sentences that uh, give us the gist of the of the article itself, and what are the the results? What are the uh, implications? And why is it important to publish it? And what will maybe affect the the practice of other surgeons? Then again, we have to go into the details of the references and the tables and figures and check the accuracy and comment on them and uh, see that everything fits. Uh, because the tendency to, to, uh, 
browse to the references and just have a look at them many times. Um, it, may, it really makes a difference if you have good references. Sometimes uh, authors just collect a lot of references that are not really related to the, to the topic, and just to get a nice list. So we have to uh, go over that as well. So what makes a, a good reviewer? Uh, the review should be comprehensive, really helpful. So of course we expect everything to be on time. There's limited time. We don't want to uh, the author to wait too much. Usually within a few weeks, two or three weeks, that's a, a allocated time for the reviewers. Um, we expect well-founded comments and as I said, constructive criticism, uh, be objective, and we expect the reviewer to give a clear recommendation to us uh, or to the, to the, uh, the chief editor, uh, what, we, what should we actually do with this paper? So if you look at the process that the, the, this manuscript go through uh, from submission, so first uh, there's uh, some pre-check and, uh, and we uh, send it to for a, preview, a peer review and then we can, can get a recommendation whether to accept it. If it's really exceptional, it's really ac accepted immediately, but many times we send out the papers for revision. It can be minor revision for a few details or, or language editing or things that are not really uh, essential to the topic, but to the format of the, of the paper. And many times we actually ask for a major revision, uh, but these revisions, I can get can tell you a secret, most of the revisions eventually end up with acceptance. Uh, if, if you get a, a, re, a you get the, the paper back asking you to revise it, you can actually be happy that most probably you revise it and everything will go well. Maybe you revise it once more, but eventually you'll get accept accepted. Uh, some of the rejections are immediate. Uh, we don't really even send her to peer review because it's obvious that this is below the level of the, of the journal, but uh, most, of the page, uh, most of the papers will get a, a professional peer review. After the acceptance, of course, there's still a process of preparing the, pay, the, the paper for uh, publication, the proofreading, and all this uh, uh, preparation of, uh, that leads to the, public, the publication itself. Uh, the revisions sometimes uh, we have to re-review -re uh, papers that were sent for revision came back and then we send them uh, again to the same reviewers that already saw the paper and uh, reviewed it initially uh, to see whether the replies of the um, authors or the corrections that were made are really appropriate and according to what they suggested and uh, if everything is, is fits, then uh, we make a recommendation uh, saying to the author that we decide to, to publish it. One more uh, thing that I want to mention is the detection of plagiarism. I mentioned that before. This is done mainly electronically now. There are many uh, ways to do it. Every journal uses a different uh, format, but there are online uh, ways to actually compare uh, what was sent as a written text to multitude of other papers that are in the database. So eventually you get a, a percentage of how much similar this, this article is to other articles. And it's very easy You see, you get a nice report with percentages and colors, and it's very easy to say to the to the author, okay, here your percentage is 
above 30, 35% of uh, concordance with other articles or maybe your own articles in the past. So you have to either re reject it or revise it. It's unfortunately, it's quite common to, to see that. And uh, that's why we, we need these uh, modalities of uh, electronic detection. This goes almost automatically through the editorial manager. It's not actually the work of the peer reviewer itself, himself, but actually the, done by, uh, by the editorial uh, manager. And this is, a, as I said, unfortunately, we see it more and more today, the pressure to create papers, to publish, uh, it has financial uh, implication, it's, a, it's a, an honor, you, you get promoted and people are doing things that we really like, don't like them to do. And uh, the, the, there are many ways to, to detect them and catch it. But eventually some of them are being published and eventually uh, retracted because they found it uh, only later, but uh, this is actually being done for every paper before publication. So this is the uh, workflow of, of manuscript that uh, get accepted. And then we uh, going through, go through the process of uh, che checking for citation for the references. And uh, also there are some now there's an ombudsman, ombuds uh, person that they uh, review to ensure that there's no uh, racial or cultural or uh, other biases that should not be published. And we say, uh, check everything that uh, everything should, should pass. And then uh, sometimes we invite, if it's really interesting uh, topic that needs some uh, other comments, we send, uh, we ask for invited commentary on Article that, that seems to be more leading the the the, the topic, or maybe have a, a way to to change the, really change the practice of surgeons. Then many times we uh, ask for a commentary. Uh, it's like an editorial about the same topic, referring to the article itself and uh, the topic in general. So that's in few words, that's the process that uh, the manuscripts, submitted manuscript to go through. And if you have any questions, I'll be happy to reply. Thank you very much, Danny. That's very interesting as, as a really good overview of the process. And I think some of our listeners might be a little bit shy or hesitant to ask questions, but I'll kick off. I'll ask a couple of questions. And uh, there's a question from Ahmed. Hello, Ahmed. Ahmed is uh, from the US. So he asks, uh, what do you think about the overall quality of submitted manuscripts now versus, let's say, 20 years ago? Um, it's really difficult to, to, to say because the process is uh, much more complicated and the threshold for acceptance, at least in the leading journals, is much higher. Uh, but what we see around is that there are many, many journals that have lesser, the lower threshold. And then eventually what you get to, to see in print, the, the amount of uh, papers that are being published every year is huge. So you, you can see everything. Uh, there are many uh, very low level, low quality articles that get published and eventually get cited uh, also. So, uh, you know, once it's, it's published, you cannot, it's very rare to, to, for a paper to be retracted or erased for, for maybe it will just be being ignored, but uh, many low level uh, articles are being published all the time. So I cannot really, the, the spectrum is very wide, but we try to, at least in the leading journals, we try to make the process of the selection process, the peer review process, professional. And this is time, this is many times, uh, sometimes annoying for the authors because sometimes we, they have to wait quite a, quite a bit until the, pap uh, the paper is published, sometimes many months. 
because of this process. Uh, to reject is usually quite quicker, but to, to accept takes more time and because of the revision and rare revisions and you have to be sent to the reviewers again and come back. So uh, there's, there's a selection of the good articles to the good, to the leading journals. But even there, you, you see sometimes articles that somehow passed the, the obstacles and got published, you can say by chance. Sometimes it really, it really by chance because you send an article uh, to two, maybe three reviewers and you know, out of a list of hundreds. So there's a lot of, uh, it's not very objective. There are some criteria that you use. And as I said, as I showed, there are some ways to do a good peer review, but it's not always done. So uh, we see, I think eventually we see uh, more articles that are of less importance. Uh, people are stressing their, uh, using a lot of statistics, of course, it's, it's mandatory to, to use the statistics. And many times the result is statistical, but less clinical, with less clinical uh, uh, importance. So um, good questions, which I don't have a very strict answer for that. But uh, we see a lot of, the spectrum is very wide. Yeah, thank you. Um, just for our uh, junior doctor's information, um, tell me if I'm wrong, but all of the work that you do and the work that's done by members of the editorial board and the editor, this is work done in a honorary capacity, right? You're not uh, being paid. I know reviewers don't yeah. get paid. No, no, it's, it's uh, on, you can say honorary. Yeah. Honorary, yeah. So um, the next question for me is that there are some people who seem to think that um, the first publication in a specific journal, like say the World Journal of Surgery, the British Journal of Surgery, is a bit difficult. But then once you get a paper in, um, and, and therefore if you publish before, then um, the chances of acceptance becomes a little bit higher. Is there any truth in that? Um, I'm not sure, man. If you're really a leader in the field and you have a lot of papers and they know your name and maybe, it, yeah, it, it may affect, but it's not that like you did once and then everything will go very smoothly for you and uh, you don't have to work hard. Uh, that's yeah. not like that. Yeah. It's true that if you come, if you are leading in the field, you come from a central uh, leading place with a lot of experience, a lot of the numbers are bigger, so it's easier for you to, to publish. But um, of course, there's a bias here as well. But yeah. it's, uh, I, I can say that it's true psychologically because once you get over your first paper and you get to know the, the format, you get to know how, how it works, then you, there are some barriers, psychological barriers that may fall and you can continue, continue to do that. You see, it's not that, it's not that difficult. It can be done. So yeah. in, in that aspect, yes, but in, regarding the acceptance, I'm not sure. Okay, great. So Dario is asking, what's your opinion about open access journals and are the processes you presented and respected in these open access journals? Uh, I don't like them. <laughs> I can say I don't like it. I never uh, sent to open access. I mean, some some of the uh, open access is part of the main journals that yeah. they, they the article is very important. They, they open that as an open access. That that's a completely different thing. But open access journal are paid journal. You have to pay for for publication. And once you put the money in the process, the the it's, it's not the same process. I mean, it's a, uh, uh, you get some kind of bias into, positive bias into the process. And I think the interest the, to, to earn money is, mm. may, may uh, I mean, they, they claim that they are peer reviewed, but I think it was differently. So I don't like to, I never sent to, to uh, open access a journal, and I also don't like to get reviews. When they ask me for review, I just don't accept that. 
Yeah. I don't like to cooperate with this, but I know it's there. I mean, it's a huge business and uh, it will not uh, disappear easily. Yeah. Many times, if you if you think about, if you want to see your name in print, you can do that. But if you want to uh, keep yourself within the quality uh, journal, which also have academic uh, importance, but uh, because uh, eventually, if you open, if you publish in in uh, open access uh, journals, it will not have a lot of uh, academic. Uh, you don't get a lot of academic points for that. Uh, usually, the uh, uh, grading is is lesser. I mean, they they can be very popular because they are free, but uh, the, the academic quality is, is lower. So uh, mm -hmm. you don't gain gain much from publishing there. Yeah, thank you. Uh, just one other question from me, uh, and then uh, let's see if anyone else has a question. So is there a lot of pressure, um, or if there is, how much pressure is there to, uh, um, on the editorial board, on you, on the editor-in-chief, to try and increase the impact factor? And uh, would you then prefer certain types of articles like systematic reviews and meta-analysis because they might be cited more often? Uh, I think it's there. Yeah, you're right. Uh, it happens, and uh, we we take that into consideration because you know that the, the quality of the journal. I mean, it's like feeding itself. So if you if you get a, a high impact factor journal, you get more important articles being submitted to that journal. So uh, it's circular, and eventually, it's it's one of the aims of the of the journal to be to increase it impact factor so we, and indeed the publishing uh, like uh, uh, consensus uh, statements or uh, good guidelines reviews which will have large uh, wide readership and usually we, we tend we love these uh, papers yeah that's true yeah. We, it, it still doesn't mean that we'll uh, accept them without uh, regardless of the quality but uh, these are articles that really increase the impact factor. I think they have some some kind of preference. Yeah, great. Thank you very much, Danny. I really appreciate this. And um, so I don't think there are any further questions. Uh, I would like to ask one. Uh, yes, go for it. Very quickly, if that's okay. Um, now, uh, you mentioned that uh, as an associate editor, you receive quite a lot of papers and you do a, some sort of first screening uh, yeah, in terms of the relevance. Yeah. Um, how collegial is the decision about what is relevant for your journal? So how often does that get kind of reviewed within you and your colleagues? And uh, how collegial is the decision about what's important and what's not important for your journal? Uh, the triage or the, the, the immediate rejection that we do is, if we see that it's really unrelated to the topics that the uh, the, the journal deals with that, that's easy we can say tell the author uh, okay it's not really appropriate for this this uh, kind of journal find something more specific or but that that uh, doesn't happen much most of the uh, immediate rejection or immediate selection is done due to really low quality that you really don't want to spend um too much effort on the on your reviewers that they I mean send to reviewers that and uh, it's actually reviewing is is a really tough process i mean you, sometimes you could do it quite quickly but uh, you don't want to send very low quality articles to reviewers you prefer to to keep them for the real world so uh, most of the immediate selection is done based on quality Low, you see that's really low quality, very low numbers, uh, unrandomized, uh, or very poorly written by articles. So we try to keep uh, the triage of these uh, articles to, to not a minimum, no? not to not to, to give the benefit of doubt of peer review to most of the articles. Lovely, great. Thank you. Right, so thank you very much, Danny, again. Uh, it's beyond 11 o'clock for you, so uh, a 
appreciate your time. So thank you for the invitation. It was very very nice. I really appreciate your uh, <laughs> your system, and it was very nice. Also, the presentation in the beginning, I really enjoyed that. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in and listening. Until next time, keep running your life with our surgical podcast.